I'm going to do it before we pray. And I was like, this Brandon now? And he said, no. Nope. I, like, I was like, well, it's not going to work. Brandon's going to be like, I'm asking yeah. <laughs> That happened to me a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That was good. Oh, okay. Woo. All right, everybody's ready. Uh, Brandon is going to read from Psalm 34, I believe. Yes, uh, Psalm 34 versus... Uh, one, two, and three. Um, so, yeah, and this has been my prayer, you know, it's just that we're, we're at a place of this. Is uh, It reads, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will consistently speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. So, it's... Uh, it's been, you know, Jesus really dropped it on my heart, and it's just, you know, it's very fitting, you know, I think, too, right before we go into worship, it reminds me of worship, you know, as we, we gather together in his name and in his presence and go to, to praise his name, but I, I just, as you see in that, you know, it, it speaks of just constantly doing it, and um, I just hope that we're all people that do that, you know, that we're just constantly praising and exalting his name. Do you want to follow that up with some prayer before we get into yeah, some worship? For sure, yeah. Um, I would like to do that. Yeah, Lord uh, Jesus, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for uh, <coughs> the family of believers that you've placed um, around us, er, around me, and just here this time. And uh, I want to lift each and every one of us up and, uh, to you. Lord, I pray that. You just fill us with the Holy Spirit even more in this moment, Lord. I pray that we are just focused on you and you alone as we uh, are getting ready to hear a message from you through Ken, Lord. And I, uh, I pray that, you know, too, as well, again, that we just are constantly uh, people that are praising you in every moment. And we are just exalting your name um, in every moment. And that we use every opportunity just to lift your name high um, and to exalt you. And it's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.
I'm going to read another psalm. Good place to go here. Psalm 23. We've heard this one. Good reminder. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. (coughs) And so, uh... Whenever we talk about being clean or, you know, how are we doing, if we're doing good or not, it's just when's the last time we're going to cross. And so, this is, these are some of the promises that Jesus gives when we come to him at the cross, you know. Peace in our lives, man, and a future to hope. So, um, let's take this time and uh, if there is some unrest, um, let's come and take that to the cross of Jesus.
I had this really uh, awesome story that I heard earlier this week that I thought would have been really great to share with you guys tonight, but I found out it wasn't true. So I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't start communion with a, a false uh, story. So, um, so just praying about it. Uh, uh, this is basically what uh, I feel like the Lord gave me. So I, most of you guys are pretty familiar with Isaiah 55, 13, right? Um, and that's where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. And these events will bring great, great honor to the Lord's name, and they will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. And uh, it got me thinking about thorns and nettles, right? So thorns are pretty obviously, um, they're obvious, right? There's, they're usually huge, they're usually ugly looking. You know without a question, you should probably stay away from them because, you know, uh, people know to avoid them, right? Um, and I think that's a lot of us, right? The thorns. Uh, I think we, we, our life before Jesus, you know, resembled that. Well, the thing about nettles is nettles from a distance actually look pretty nice. They're lush and green. There's nettles that have beautiful flowers on them. But really, the result is the same. If you go to reach out and grab them, you're still going to get stung or poked because there's still thorns on them, right? And that just felt like, uh, I think a lot of times, um, you know, we look at people that are successful by worldly standards or people that uh, seem like they have everything together, right? But without Jesus they're still thorny underneath, right? They, they have an appearance that looks nice, but there's still that same thorniness that needs transformation. And so the, the beautiful thing about that is that both of those things, thorns and nettles, need to be transformed by Jesus. And uh, so what does that have to do with communion? Um, I think a lot of us, when we come to know Jesus uh, and we head out into other groups of believers, we tend to take either that thorn identity or that nettle identity with us. And so what I mean by that is, um, even though after Jesus transforms us, we're all part of the same garden, so to speak, um, you know, we, nettles tend to avoid thorns, and thorns don't tend to go by nettles, right? That's what I mean by we bring that stuff into the church with us. And that's not how God intended his, his garden or his body to be. And so, um, just as I was reading that, that just felt, uh, man, it just felt appropriate for the way um, I see things going on in, in the body of Christ. And so... Um, you know, as we go into communion, uh, Jesus gave me 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. And it's, uh, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. And so, um, you know, I, I just pray uh, that... Each one of us, when we're around other believers that maybe come from different backgrounds or, or have very different um, perspectives on life, that we all show each other Jesus' love because we are all supposed to be part of one body, right? And so um, that's just what I, I what that reminded me of was, was Ken's message on Sunday when he was talking about Jesus didn't take a bunch of demon-possessed guys in a boat to go minister to a demon-possessed guy, right? And so, um, yeah, I just, I just pray that we all would have that perspective of love for each other as Christians and, and uh, you know, desire unity in the body of Jesus. And so, uh, when Jesus uh, took some bread and gave thanks to God for it, he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. 
in agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So let's be unified in communion tonight. So, uh, going into this next song, uh, this song talks about intimacy with Jesus. Really, uh, what it looks like to <laughs> desire and strive for a close relationship with Jesus. You know, we can have lots of acquaintances and people we know, but. Uh, we know of people, but intimacy is really experiencing and knowing them even deeper than you would just another another brother or sister. But like this really close knit relationship where uh, where you really share each other, you share each other's hearts and desires, and uh, and so a scripture reference that I want to point us to. <coughs> lead us into the song is out of Philippians 3 where Paul's expressing <clears throat> everything is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for his sake I've discarded everything else counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him uh, and that is our desire of seeing him as our treasure we could get rid of everything we could lose everything if we could gain Jesus in that way. And so I pray that that's our desire when we talk about surrendering all, um, uh, just chasing after Him, knowing Him, um, knowing that nothing else really matters other than spending time with Him. Um, so I pray that our hearts are lifted up to Him uh, as we sing these songs here. <coughs> Desire is to know you deep. 
Jesus, have your way. And so I think what led me to choose this song uh, for us to sing this week uh, leads me to the line in the chorus where it talks about our chains are gone. <coughs> and, you know, I find myself struggling with the old sinful nature time and time again, which is those chains, you know. Um, not grasping the fact that Jesus has taken that, of understanding what he's done on the cross, of, of how, yes, I'm free from the power that Satan had in my life for so long. I don't have to pick up those chains anymore. Um, and so this perspective of, yes, temptation is inevitable, and we recognize uh, we have the opportunity to pick up those chains, but we don't, we don't, we don't need to anymore. You know, we have the freedom to choose Jesus. We're at a crossroads where he's made a way uh, for us to be able to choose him and come to him and no longer live the same uh, way we have been living before. And so um, it comes with surrender, man, as we recognize what Jesus has done, the, the passion of our Savior, read through Romans, man. We just read through Romans in a, in a Bible study, and, and ultimately I'm not going to boil it down to one verse, but you just see uh, the picture of the cross there through Romans, what grace really looks like, and, and how we have the opportunity to be free, um, free from the chains, and a slave to righteous living now.
So listen, we're going to be in uh, we're going to be in John uh, sixteen. Uh, before I get there, I want to tell you guys how excited I am to be with you guys tonight, and that doesn't mean that I'm not excited to be with you other nights. Um, but I just had this excitement tonight 
you know, usually I'm, I'm, um, I'm rushing around, I'm, you know, pushing up against the clock and trying to get out of my office and get here on time, but just, man, had such a great time with Jesus today and just spending time with him. And um, it was like, it had to be two o'clock and I'm like, I'm ready to go now. Like, I was ready to see you guys at 2 o'clock. I was ready to, to come and just lay eyes on you and just be around you and just be with you and just spend time together. And should have called um, What's that? Just, just call it. I, I, I should have yeah, just, just called it in early. Um, you know, it's one of those things I was thinking of, you know, I, I think of this a lot because, um, well, I do this a lot. So um, I, I think sometimes I like to think about, like, you know, the beginning of a message, like when you get here, and I, I like to think of different things that, you know, sometimes it's just easy, like Jesus just puts something on your heart, and you're just, you know, going, hey, this is just like now, where I'm going, hey, I just couldn't wait to be with you guys, but so like, then I get into this place where I start to think about, you know, sometimes what other pastors say, what I've heard other pastors say, because I know that it can be that moment where they're, you're, you know, they're really big on the intro, and I'm really unbalanced, and things like that, and so... Um, there's this one guy that I heard and he loved to say, like when he would get in this place, um, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? You know, and, and everybody was like, yeah, you know, and, and give God some praise and we want to clap. And I don't know that there's anything wrong with that. And I know I'm not perfect with my language sometimes. And sometimes we just say things. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, you know what I mean? But, um, I was thinking about like after last week's <coughs> message. Um, on Wednesday specifically, and talking about the promise of this relationship that we get to have with Jesus, you know. And so if I could say something like that to start our time right now, it would say, man, isn't it great to be the house of the Lord? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, yeah, and, and some of us would be like, yes. <laughs> and then I would have to ask, but like, is it, is it great to be that, because it's a rhetorical question. Of course, it's great to have God living inside of you, and yet I get really excited to do this. The time I get to spend with Jesus, to be used by Him in my spiritual gifting, and to stand up and do this kind of stuff. And, and yet, I was thinking today that if people didn't leave here last Wednesday and, and spend time with Jesus, and were <laughs> intentional. On like going, oh my gosh, like hold on a minute. I, I can actually spend time with Jesus. If people weren't pushing in deeper to Jesus, to knowing him more, to spending more time with him, I'm just like, oh, it, it just really, it saddens my heart. Because more than just being used by Jesus, and, and it, as amazing as that is in doing this, I'm going, I, I just want it to, to really affect you guys. I want you to really grab hold of it while you're here. And then when you leave, you know, go, oh, man, I, I've really, I've just been focused on promises and not the promise giver. And man, the promise that I'm able to be really close to Jesus and that it would drive you closer to him. And so is it great for you? Has it been great for you to be the house of the Lord? Like where he dwells, and that's part of like my excitement to even come here right now. And like tonight, I was just really, you know, as I even thought about that, I'm like, you know, it's not like I'm just the house of the Lord, or Billy's just the house of the Lord, or Brandon. It's just like, no, 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 all of us are these individual houses that are being united together to build this larger house. That's amazing. I mean, it's just so amazing that. You know, that Jesus lives in us. I just, I've been having a lot of those moments where I'm just sitting there and I'm, uh, you know, I have an alarm on my phone that goes off on Tuesday nights at 7.07 uh, p.m. And there's nothing super spiritual about that time, but it just happened to be uh, a, an alarm that was already set in my phone for some reason. But it goes off every Tuesday for Elkins, West Virginia, for, for some family that I have in Jesus there. Um, some brothers and some sisters that I met when I got to go up there and spend the weekend preaching and teaching and, and sharing the story of what Jesus has done in my life. 
and, and when that went off last night, it's so funny because my kids know what it is. The alarm went off and, you know, they start to go, oh, is that Elkins? And can I pray? And we spend time really praying. And just the simplicity of sitting there and I was like, is, does it blow your mind that I'm like, okay, Jesus, like I'm here in Worcester and I'm praying to you for people in Elkins, West Virginia, and you're there. <coughs> Like, that, those are things that we just think are, like, small things. But I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy that this all-powerful being sitting on the throne is there right now and on the other side of the planet right now and just everywhere. And yet, when I talk to him, he's, he's going to listen. And, and then he's going to respond to that. That's just, it's just... Moments like that where I was just telling my kids last night, like, this is just crazy that how awesome Jesus is and how powerful he is and how we just go about our business a lot of times and don't sit there. And, and a lot of times I think we struggle with being in awe of God. And it's like, just because just you just don't think of who he really is. You don't just really sit there and think of the things that we think are just small things. But like, how crazy is that? That's so awesome. It's so awesome. And so, um, I, I, really, I really hope that it's great for you to be the house of the Lord. And that you really understand what that means. What that means. And so, we're, we're in John chapter 16. I'm going to go through and read... Um, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and 33. John chapter 16, uh, verses 1 through 4 and 33. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. For you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now, so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier, because I was going to be with you for a while longer. Verse 33, I've told you all this, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome uh, the world. Uh, let me pray for us again. Lord Jesus, we ask that your word um, would change us for real. As we sing songs, Jesus, and say we, we desire something new, we know that's not because you're changing, but because... Um, you're infinite and there's no way that we have you all figured out and so what we're really saying is just like that song continues to say we want to know you more would you use your word Jesus that we would know you more that we would have a a better understanding of who you are and in that, we would be changed. We would be humbled in your presence and drawn close to you. <coughs> it's in your name. Amen. <coughs> so, um, <clears throat> so when you think about, like, you know, Thanksgiving is tomorrow, and we're all going to get together, and it's a time of year where, you know, a lot of times people get together, and because it's called Thanksgiving, it's time to be thankful um, and people are going to get together and they're going to say what they're thankful for and spend time doing that and focusing on things that they're thankful for. And if I went around this room and I asked you, you know, what you're thankful for, what would happen is, you know, we, we get a lot of good stuff. It'd be good stuff. Um, uh, we get a lot of things though that were probably positive or what we think of as positive. And one of the things people probably wouldn't, uh, say I'm thankful for is trouble. And Jesus here is saying, hey, 
You're going to have all this trouble. You're going to have all these sorrows, right? And, and at the beginning of this chapter, he's talking about uh, even from other believers. He's going, there's going to be people that are going to kill you. They're going to think they're following Jesus. Can we just acknowledge right now that maybe we don't really have the definition of a bad day cornered? <laughs> As we just look at this and we just see where Jesus is going, man, people are going to throw you out of the synagogue with everything they owned and everything, you know, uh, about them and their status and everything and treat them like outcasts. And maybe some of us know what that kind of feels like in society or in the world. But then he goes on to say, you know, people are going to kill you and they're going to think they're doing it for, for God. And so then on the other side of that, uh, you know, in verse 33, he goes, hey, and just in general, you're going to have all kinds of troubles and sorrows in this life. You're going to have all kinds of troubles. You're going to, it says many. That's what it says here. It says, I've told you all these things or all this so that you may have peace in me here on earth. You will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart. Jesus is going, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And, and so like if I started to ask you what you're thankful for, a lot of us wouldn't bring up troubles. A lot of us wouldn't bring up sorrows. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't make our thankful list. And yet Jesus, when he talks about uh, troubles and sorrows, even by people who think they know God in Matthew 5, he says, hey, when that happens to you and people persecute you and they mock you and they say all kinds of evil things about you, he says, be happy. In, in fact, he says, be very glad about it. And then in James 1, in talking about just regular troubles and sorrows of the world, and maybe not necessarily just following Jesus and people aren't wanting to just give you trouble because you're following Jesus, but just being in a sinful, fallen, broken world, the troubles and all the sorrows that you'll have. And Jesus says there'll be many in James 1. He goes, hey, consider it an opportunity for great joy. And so Jesus clearly talks about troubles and sorrows in a positive way. Even here as he's telling us about it, he goes, I'm telling you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. So that you'll remember everything that I told you. And remember, last week we were talking about this relationship we have with Jesus. And now being the house of God, having the Holy Spirit in us. And one of the things I'm doing is he's always pointing us to Jesus. He's always reminding us of what Jesus has told us, what Jesus has said. And even at the... The back side of this on 33, verse 33, he says, I've told you all this so that you'll actually have peace in me. Now, when we think about somebody saying, I told you so, it usually doesn't have a, a very good, um, you know, context to it. Uh, like usually when somebody tells you, I told you so, uh, either they just want to point out, hey, I was right and you were wrong, or usually it's after the fact of something happening and there's not a whole lot you can do about it, but just sit there and kind of go, oh yeah, I should have listened or something like that. But see, it's different with Jesus here. In fact, his, his I told you so is like, hey, I'm telling you this and I'll remind you of this when you're in the middle of troubles, when you're in the middle of sorrows, uh, so you can actually experience peace in me. And what I do know is that why people abandon things, and listen, I've seen a, a lot of people abandon their faith. I've seen a lot of people abandon their faith, or at least the faith they claim to have. And I'm not here to have the debate with people about, well, do they really believe or not? I'm going to listen. I, I don't know, but they said they believed. We saw things in their life look like they believed. And we've seen a lot of people abandon their faith. And what I know is that when people abandon something, it's because they've come to a place of hopelessness. I mean, if you think about it, if you look around and you see abandoned buildings where businesses used to be, it came to a place, in fact, another way to describe hopelessness or without hope would be desperation. It came to a place where they thought, man, there's nothing left we can do. You look at abandoned houses, it came to a place where they were like, we can't keep it, we aren't able to keep this house. If you think about when people abandon a ship, when it's sinking, it's like, hey, it's time to swim. Right? We're not going to be able to save this thing. And so my prayer specifically for us here tonight was that when we get in those places of desperation, we wouldn't abandon our faith, but we'd abandon ourselves. Yeah. Because that's 
what Jesus uses uh, the troubles and the and the sorrows and the struggles or pressure. You know, a, another way to say it would be pressure. He goes, in this world, you're going to have a lot of pressure put on you. There's going to be a lot of pressure. And so my prayer specifically has been that, hey, we, we would actually recognize in those moments that it's an opportunity to abandon ourselves and yet not our faith. Jesus says that our faith is so valuable and so precious. In fact, in 1 Peter... In 1 Peter chapter 1, when it's talking uh, about us having this priceless inheritance, in verse 4, we have this priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Then it goes on to say this, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly get, so be truly glad there's wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. And so um, I think when we think about faith a lot of times, we think like, I need more. That's usually what it is. is I'm even sitting here talking to you about this, and, and you, you start to think about the times that you've been kind of cornered or had troubles or sorrows in your life. Usually you cave, and if I start to ask you about faith and where your faith's at, and then we start to think about our faith, usually we think we need more. But what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 you don't need more faith. You need pure faith. Jesus is saying, hey, it's about quality. It's about quality of faith. It's not about some amount of faith and you need to somehow gain more. But the things that are getting in the way of your faith being pure, the things that are getting in the way uh, that are creating doubt and all these other things, right, need to be burned away. And it says right here that he uses tests and trials and things like that to purify your faith so that you'll trust him more. And I love this because it says there's wonderful joy ahead. And I think, well, let me, let me rephrase that. I know, I know to be an effective Christian or to be an effective church, which, by the way, is, is a bunch of Christians, <laughs> right, filled with the Spirit of Jesus, to be an effective Christian or to be an effective church um, you have to have the right attitude when it comes to trouble, when it comes to sorrows, when it comes to persecution, when it comes to pressure. And the only way you're going to have the, the, the right attitude and, and have the attitude that Jesus had, where it says, hey, we got to have the same attitude that Jesus had, that he, he had this equality with God, but he didn't cling to that humble himself, is, you know, you have to see trouble the right way. Right? Because when your perspective's right on something, it will, it will lead your attitude. Your attitude will fall in line. It's how you see things, how you view things in your perspective, that will determine your attitude on that. And so to be an effective Christian or to be an effective church, you have to be able to see trouble the right way, and that will lead to having the right attitude uh, when it comes to trouble, because what trouble isn't, it isn't uh, Jesus, it, it isn't saying that Jesus doesn't love you or not care about you, right? That's not what it means. And so often when we start to have trouble, or we start to have sorrows, or we start to have problems, we automatically think that this somehow reflects Jesus's attitude towards us. 
or it somehow reflects, and listen, this is what they all believed in this book a lot of times. So the people who thought they knew God that really didn't. This is why in John 9, when they're walking along, even his disciples, you know, needed to be taught this because they're like, look at this blind guy. He was blind from birth. Like, what'd he do? You know, they're like, what did he do? Jesus he had to do something wrong to be born blind or and his parents had to do something, right? If, if it wasn't him, if he didn't do something in the womb that was wrong, then his parents obviously had to do something, and that's why he's like this. And yet Jesus goes, no, no, no. It's for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. Now, because sin and brokenness, you know, has entered the world and death and all these things, why it's such a powerful thing. As I was sitting there on that last song to just hear, it means the death of death. You just think of that. Like, man, Jesus just walking out of the tomb after being dead for three days and just coming back to life through the power of the Holy Spirit and walking out of the tomb. It's like, he put death to death. Like, that's awesome. Yes. That's crazy. And, and so he goes, man, there's sin that's entered the world. There's brokenness. There's sorrows. There's going to be all kinds of that. And then he goes, See, you're going to be able to have this peace in me. And so trouble isn't. And we know this too, right? Because in the middle of trouble, Jesus being mocked and spit on and beaten and drugged to the cross. Like in the middle of trouble, he's actually displaying his love for us. He's displaying and showing his love for us. And so what it's definitely not is... is um, you know, Jesus saying he doesn't care about you or that he doesn't love you or that he's mad at you. And you know what? Trouble is, if we look at the cross, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for Jesus to display his love. That's why John 14, he goes, I'll never abandon you. I'll actually come to you. And that's why I love like Matt read like Psalm 23. And you think about the last verse there. Where, where David's going, surely your goodness and your unfailing love will follow me, what? All the days of my life. And then he goes on to eternity. He goes, and I'll live in the house of the Lord forever. Now, let me just ask you, do you think David was like special? <clears throat> so it wasn't that David was special. Jesus is special. <clears throat> and, and that's what it points to. It's not that David was special, it's that Jesus was special. Like his, he, he says, man, when I'm drawn up on the cross, when I'm put up on the cross, I'm going to draw all men to myself, right? And so he is pursuing people with his unfailing love and his goodness. The difference here is David is aware of it. And so David is living his life in a place where he is aware of Jesus' goodness and his unfailing love, pursuing him and chasing after him all the days of his life. And you know why? Not because he just laid in green pastures the whole time. It was when he got to that darkest valley. It's when he got to that darkest valley that he was like, oh man, you're close. You're close beside me. He experiences this intimacy with Jesus and this closeness with Jesus. It's when he had a bunch of enemies surrounding him and he was like, Man, Jesus took care of me and provided for me and looked out for me. And I had this closeness with Jesus in the presence of my enemy. It was because of the trouble that he went through that he was completely aware and lived his life from a place knowing that Jesus' goodness and unfailing love was pursuing him all the days of his life. And then he had that look at eternity too where he just goes, man, I'm going to be with you forever. And he just knew, he's like, all these troubles... All these things that I go through, when I lay them down next to eternity with Jesus forever, he goes, they're small. These things are small now. They're not as big as I thought they were. I put them next to eternity with Jesus and being with him forever. He goes, these things, they're small. And so David was aware of this. Because of the trouble that he went through. He was aware uh, that Jesus' unfailing love and goodness was chasing after him always. 
And so um, we think about, you know, the Bible says, uh, you know, don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. There's, there's a bunch of this, you know, that Jesus says to us. He goes, hey, don't be these things. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Don't be discouraged. Don't be anxious. And yet I think sometimes uh, we try to make it like it's okay when that's going on. Like when people are discouraged, when they're afraid, when they're anxious. Uh, it's almost like we want to go, oh, it's okay. Instead of using uh, those moments as the indicators that they are. So like when, when you're troubled or you're afraid or you're discouraged, it's an indicator of where your faith is. It's an indicator of where your hope is. I, I think it's nothing different. Now, it's nothing different than if you're driving a car. And I was going to say like a check engine light comes on, but everybody just rolls with the check engine light on now. It's like, I don't know, you know, until their engine blows up. And, and then, uh, but like if your gas gauge kicks on, right, you know. You're like, well, I gotta, I gotta stop and get some gas, and, and so these things, when these happen, because they're sinful, it's, it's no different than if I stood up here and listen. When, before I stand up here or stand up at other places, when I start to feel nervous, I know that's sinful. <clears throat> I, I know that that's sinful, and I ask Jesus before I go stand up in front of people. I'm like, I need you to crucify that, Jesus. Because the reason I'm nervous, unless I'm nervous because I'm, I'm about to stand up and open this book in and, and Jesus' word, and I'm taking that so serious that I'm like, oh, man, that's heavy. I understand that. But when it's just like, you know, when you're nervous because you're worried about what people are going to think about you or how you look or how they're going to receive what you say, it's simple. And so when you're troubled and discouraged and anxious and all that, those are moments the, the, having those feelings, those are indicators that your hope's not in, in the right place. If you look at Psalm 42, I love Psalm 40, 42. It, it starts by saying, as the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? And so you get this picture of, of, of him going, man, I just want to go be with you, Jesus. And, and you find out why right after because he starts to talk about, man, I, I got a lot of enemies going on. I got a lot of sorrows. Day and night I have tears for food. I got a lot of enemies continually surrounding me and taunting me, saying, where's this God of yours? And, and my heart breaks as I remember how it used to be as I walked among the crowds and worshipers. And so you see this picture of him going, man, I got a lot of troubles and I got a lot of sorrows and I just kind of want to be with Jesus. And, and he goes, I remember the good old days when I was able to just go to the house of God and worship and stuff. But then I love this because it goes on in verse five to say this. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I'll put my hope in God. I'll praise him again, my Savior and my God. Now I'm deeply discouraged, but I'll remember you. And so it's clearly, you know, Jesus is going, listen, when you're discouraged, when your heart's sad, he's like, you can put your hope in me. You've been putting your hope in other things. He's putting his hope in how it used to be and his circumstances and when he didn't have so many troubles, and when he didn't have sorrows, and he started to live to eternity, which isn't a bad thing, but he's missing out on the moment here to be close to Jesus in the middle of it, and then he has this realization where he goes, hold on a minute, why, why, is, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad right now? Like, I can just, I can be close to Jesus. Like, I've been putting my hope somewhere else. I'm going to put my hope in Jesus and then I won't be this way. I'm going to remember him. He's looking at everything else instead of Jesus. And what I love about this, too, is that trouble is an opportunity to long for eternity. When trouble comes, it's an opportunity to long for eternity. If you don't long for eternity when you have troubles and sorrows, if you don't long for eternity with Jesus, then you really don't understand why trouble even exists. You really don't understand that the reason that there's trouble, the reason that there's sorrows, is because of sin. And so you long for eternity when you have troubles and sorrows because you know that that's perfection. 
that being with Jesus, that there's no more of that. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. There's no more troubles. There's no more sorrow. So there's nothing like some trouble to get you to start to long for eternity. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that too is once you find yourself longing for eternity with Jesus, it gives you gratitude. Yeah. It gives you gratitude for what you do have here. Mm -hmm. It starts to get you refocused on what you do have. <clears throat> and it changes your attitude and now you're thankful. And let me just tell you, like, eternity, right, that concept of eternity and eternal life, the concept of it, is in everybody. That's why people hang on to their life. That's why people don't want to die. Because it was never the plan for people to be created and then die. Death was not part of the plan, right? It's, it's the effect of sin. And that's what's so awesome about the gospel and people who are united with Jesus is that that eternal life is restored and now you don't have to fear death anymore and you don't have to live that way you don't have to hang on to this life in that way that that, that eternal life that you long for is restored and so what I know is there's so many <coughs> opportunities in the middle of troubles and sorrows and trials that we miss and we miss out on them we miss out uh, on so many opportunities um, like just being close to Jesus nothing drives me deeper into the arms of Jesus than when I'm going through troubles when I have sorrows Because, you know, it's not just troubles and sorrows and persecution that will make you abandon your faith. I, I firmly believe that it's comfort and it's convenience that leads to complacency that, that causes people to abandon their faith. And so I praise Jesus for the times he allows me to have troubles and sorrows. So I can go run it. Now listen, if you're the one causing the troubles and sorrows, it, it still makes you run to them. You just run to the cross. But I praise Jesus for the times that, that there's troubles and there's sorrows and I, you know, I'm driven deeper into the arms of Jesus. I run to Jesus. You know, in the middle of troubles and sorrows, persecution. And it's an opportunity for Jesus' power to be seen. Right? It says that we're, we're fragile, but we have this great power from the Holy Spirit living inside of us. It's an opportunity for the power of the Holy Spirit to be seen in us. It's an opportunity for others to encounter the power of the Holy Spirit through us an opportunity for others to encounter Jesus' love, even the people maybe that are causing the trouble. It's an opportunity for them to encounter Jesus. I think one of the things that we, um, one of probably the, the most well-known verses when it comes to troubles is Romans 8.28. He says, man, Jesus uses all things for the good of those who are called according to his purpose and love him. And then I love that verse 29 tells us what his purpose is. To make us like him. To conform us. To shape us. To mold us into his image. In the middle of troubles and sorrows, it's an opportunity to be made more like Jesus. Jesus. To be conformed more into his image. It's an opportunity for spiritual growth. It's an opportunity for spiritual maturity. It says when your faith is tested and you have this endurance that grows, a spiritual endurance that grows, that you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. 
So it actually leads to contentment? I mean, there's all these opportunities and all these positive things and all these reasons that we should be thankful for trouble and trials. And I think my favorite one is it's an opportunity for us to show Jesus how much we love him. That's my favorite one. That's the one, you know, probably overlooked the most in the church. And that's probably the one nobody talks about as much as they should. But it's an opportunity to show Jesus how much you love him and to show others how much you love Jesus and to show, and to show others how valuable Jesus is, how amazing he is. We miss that one all the time. I just think, I, I think of, um, well, so like, you know what? Here, here's the thing. <laughs> we love to tell people, show me, right? Somebody tells you something, you want them to prove it to you. I, I mean, we've even done that with God. People will tell you, man, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And it's kind of like this thing where I hear people a lot of times going, well, he's going to have to show me something. He's going to have to prove that he loves me. And I'm just going, man, the cross, right? Where Jesus, you know, goes, hey, I love you. And here I've given up my life and died for you. And then yet people give lip service to, I love Jesus. People say that all the time. And you recognize biblically what that means is that you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, that's the bar. That's where it's set. That's what it means to actually love Jesus. Don't you think the one and only living God has the right to go, show me. Yeah. Show me. Walking around saying, I love Jesus. Oh, oh you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And, and then Jesus goes, okay, show me. And that's why this is my favorite one when I think about the opportunities in trouble. Because I just think about how we'll gather in stadiums, tons of people, and look down at a stage or on a field to see what the players are going to do. And yet I get this picture as I'm reading Job in Job chapter 1, where it's the heavenly court, right? And, and there's God. And Satan walks in and he's been patrolling the earth. And there's just angels and demons and Satan and the world just sitting there. And I just love how God goes, have you seen Job? He goes, he loves me. It's like, I, I want to be that guy. I want Jesus to go, have you seen Ken? Have you seen Ty? Have you seen Marvin? Like, I want to be that guy that Jesus points to and goes, now he loves me. I, I mean, I want us to be that church that's the example of what it really means to love Jesus, that Jesus would point and go, have you seen my church really recovered? Yeah. 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 Have you seen them? Yes. Where everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat in the heavenly court looking down, going, what are they going to do? What are they going to do when this trouble comes? What are they going to do when this sorrow comes? What's he going to do? What's she going to do? And Jesus is going, have you seen my servant? Watch, they love me. And we miss out on that all the time. We miss that opportunity. We make it about us. We get focused on ourselves. Start thinking that Jesus is getting mad at us or whatever's going on. And it's just like, it's an opportunity to display how much we love him. And Jesus goes, you're going to have many, many sorrows, many troubles. He goes, but take heart. You know, be cheerful. That's what I mean. It's he goes, be cheerful, because I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. Let's pray.